Hi everyone, thank you for watching the Trinity channel and today is day number two of the fifth international marathon and uh, this is, uh, my name is Basim Goria and with me Sister Nawal. Hi Sister Nawal. Hello Dr. Basim. And uh, just soon, in about a few minutes, we're going to start with uh, uh, the first show of today. Today we have five shows and the show today is going to be about uh, biology and the Bible, biology and the Bible, because some universities or professors or people, they think that the, this new technology and research are proving against the Bible. And today we will have four or five big guys, they're going to be on air proving the other side, proving some, uh, uh, some evidences, they will be talking about some evidences from <clears throat> uh, live uh, sciences uh, that how this uh, science, the new research, the new technology, that they are proving the scripture's liability. And uh, please stay tuned. And uh, I want to encourage you to, to support this channel. This is the unique channel. Trinity Channel is the only channel that is dedicated to uh, apologetics to um, atheist, to Islam, and agnostic, and also to other cults. Now, what do you have something to say about it? Well, the the, the work is great. The vision is great. Uh, our God is Almighty God, and uh, now it's about time to uh, be a partner of this uh, ministry, and not to just to stay and watch. Uh, we, of course, we are praying that you enjoy, that you uh, learn a lot about uh, many things uh, presented in this show. As Dr. Bassem just mentioned, we have five. And now it's the time to be a partner of this uh, huge ministry. We thank God it's a privilege for each one of us here uh, working in this uh, big job. Um, we are praying that to, uh, the Lord will touch the hearts right now and maybe you don't want to waste the time and call the numbers uh, you're going to see on the screen wherever you watch this show from Europe, Europe, Middle East, North Africa, uh, North America, of course. Uh, this is uh, where we broadcast. Um, many um, update needs to be uh, in front of the camera, maybe in uh, another uh, maybe 15 minutes or uh, I mean half an hour or maybe after an hour we'll update you about more details about this ministry. God bless you. We, uh, we are praying that you will enjoy this uh, coming show. Amen. And in uh, less than one minute, I will hand over to Brother Tony, the host here in, um, in the studio. Just to remind you again, we have a few uh, great speakers and uh, professors and doctors we have uh, brother uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy from uh, UK, Europe. We have Dr. Faz Rana from um, uh, Reese, uh, uh, RTB, Reasons to Believe. And we have Dr. Ben uh, Miller and uh, some other speakers. They're going to be talking about this subject, biology and uh, the Bible. But please, if you are in Europe or Middle East, or in Australia or here in North America, uh, stay tuned, but also pray for us and support us, support this channel so that it will be, keep going. Thank you again and God bless you all. Hello everyone, this is Tony Gourlay with Ratio Christi. The Ratio Christi is a Campus Apologetics Alliance. We set up Christian apologetics clubs on university, college, and community college campuses around the United States. We have international clubs now as well. And we're also moving down into high school. So you can go to our web website, ratiochristi.org. That is R-A-T-I-O-C-H-R-I-S-T-I.org. And you can look up to see if we have a club or a chapter on a campus near you. And if we don't have one, we want to get one there as soon as possible. So please contact us at ratiochristi.org. But I want to welcome you back to the, the fifth International Apologetics Marathon 
uh, here at ABN Sat and on the Trinity Channel. And we ask that you would support uh, Trinity Channel because your support allows these marathons to continue. And you can see how educational they are. All these scholars who we bring in to interview, it is, it's, just a, uh, it's just equipping to so many people. So we thank you for your support and that you'd continually do so. Uh, today's first show is called Biology in the Bible, Evidences from the Life Sciences for Scripture's Reliability. We have a number of guests today. Our first guest is Dr. Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe, or uh, RTB, uh, reasons.org. Uh, Dr. Fuzz Rana is the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe. Uh, he's a, a biochemist. Um, and he writes and speaks extensively about evidence for creation emerging from biochemistry, genetics, human, origin, human origins, and synthetic biology. As Vice President of Research and Apologetics at RTB, he is dedicated to communicating to skeptics and believers alike the powerful scientific case for God's existence and the Bible's reliability. Fuzz converted to Christianity during graduate school. Though he initially embraced evolutionary, the evolutionary paradigm, Fuzz eventually drew the conclusion that only a creator's involvement could explain the elegance of biochemical systems. But it was only after his fiancée's pastor uh, challenged him to read the Bible that Fuzz became convinced of the valid validity of Christ's claims and of his own need for a savior. So we praise God for, for that. Uh, the death of his Muslim father some, some years later uh, helps us appreciate the necessity of evangelism and Christian apologetics and led him to join the RTB team in 1999. Today, Fuzz addresses science, faith, uh, hot topics through books including Creating Life in the Lab and The Cell's Design, as well as articles, videos, podcasts, and speaking engagements. And he has addressed audiences at over 500 universities, churches, and conferences around the world. Uh, formerly a senior scientist in research and development at Procter & Gamble, uh, Dr. Rana graduated with highest honors from West Virginia State College, uh, now university with a, a BS in chemistry, and he went on to earn a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. Uh, it, there at Ohio University, he was awarded the Donald Klippinger Research Award, and he pursued postdoctoral studies in the biophysics to, of cell membranes at the universities of Virginia and Georgia. Uh, several articles by Fuzz have been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals such as Biochemistry, Applied spectros spectro uh, Spectroscopy, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, FEBS Letters, Journal of Microbiological Methods, and the Journal of Chemical Education. And he has delivered numerous presentations at international uh, scientific meetings. He also holds two patents authored a chapter on molecular convergence and intelligent design for the nature of nature, and co-wrote a chapter on antimicrobial peptides for biological and synthetic membranes. Fuzz lives in Southern California with his wife, Amy, and they have five children. Uh, with a, a resume like that, Dr. Rana, it is a, a blessing to have you here on our show today. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. We also have uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, Jonathan McClatchy is a Christian writer, speaker, and debater. He holds a bachelor's degree with honors in forensic biology, a master's in a degree in evolutionary biology, and a second master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience. Currently, Jonathan is a PhD student in cell biology. He is a proponent of the scientific theory of intelligent design, also known as ID about which he has written extensively on, ev on evolution news and views. And he also is involved with the Center for Intelligent Design in the UK. Uh, between 2012 and 2013, he served as an employee for the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. And in addition, Jonathan is also a contributor 
to various apologetics websites, including crossexamine.org, uh, which is a great website, Dr. Frank Turek, and the Christian Apologetics Alliance. Jonathan has also been interviewed on podcasts and radio shows, including Unbelievable on C Premier Christian Radio, Apologetics 315, Theology Matters with the Palouz, uh, and Solid Reasons Morning Show, uh, Dogma Debate and Spices, Spice FM's Islamic Eye on the East programming. And uh, Jonathan has participated in several debates with both atheists and Muslims. Welcome back to the show once again, jo Jonathan McClatchy. Thanks for having me. Our, th our third guest is Dr. Brian Miller. Uh, Dr. Brian Miller is an apologist for every nation churches and campus ministries. He has a uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics from MIT, and he also has a PhD in Physics from Duke University. So we would like to welcome Dr. Brian Miller to our show as well. Thank you. Now, we, I, re, I personally really appreciate all three of you being here because uh, scientific apologetics is not uh, uh, something that I am strong in, so I'm actually looking forward to learning uh, just as much as our audience is, I'm sure. So we have um, uh, a number of scholars with us today, and as I said, they all have extensive knowledge in, in uh, scientific apologetics, and apologetics, again, is the defense of the Christian faith. And how does science and Christianity uh, go together. Many times people will say, well, Christianity is false because I, I just look to science, and science proves that Christianity, Christianity is false. But you need to remember that uh, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And uh, we have some scientists with us today who are Christians, and they have found a compatibility with scientific uh, knowledge and research and discoveries with their Christian faith. So it is a blessing to have them here today. But uh, Dr. Rana, I'd like to ask you a question first, um, because you've said that biochemistry has paved the way for your conversion to Christianity, and that sounds absurd to a lot of people, probably around the world, who, who believe, again, that uh, science and faith are incompatible. Uh, can you tell us how you uh, became a Christian uh, by, through that means? Sure, sure can. Uh, well, when I went to graduate school, I was an agnostic. Uh, I didn't know if God existed or not, and honestly didn't care one way or the other. That question was the furthest thing from my consideration as a, a graduate student beginning my studies in biochemistry. I was very focused on earning my PhD in biochemistry, uh, but as I immersed myself in the study of the cell's chemical systems, I very quickly came to appreciate how complex those systems are, but also I came to appreciate their beauty and their elegance and their sophistication and their ingenuity. And I asked myself, how do scientists explain where these systems come from uh, via evolutionary processes? And as I examined those different explanations, I found them to be, frankly, inadequate. And it was at that point I was convinced that there had to be a mind of some sort that undergirded uh, life itself, that was responsible for bringing life into existence. And of course, that then led to follow-up questions, who is that creator and how do I relate to that creator? And after six months exploring that question, I was confronted with the gospel by a pastor who ultimately married my wife and I, and he challenged me to read uh, uh, the Bible for the first time in my life as a 23-year-old. And as I was reading through the Gospel of Matthew and specifically the Sermon on the Mount, I was convinced that Jesus was who Christians claimed him to be, and I acknowledged Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And so it was, in effect, God revealed to us through the record of nature, and God revealed to me through the pages of Scripture that brought me to faith in Christ. It's great to hear stories like that, especially because so many people sometimes say that uh, science has led them away from uh, faith. Of course, uh, they probably, of course, weren't Christians to begin with, but they, they probably grew up in a, a, what we'd call a Christian home. They, they were nominal, uh, maybe nominal Christians uh, at, at best, and they said, that, you know, I started to, to study science, and that led me away because it didn't seem like it was compatible. So it, it's, it's uh, great to hear testimonies of people who, who look to science and say, hey, you know, this... Uh, this blends right up with uh, the, the God of the Bible who, who created and uh, a much better explanation than, 
then uh, something came from nothing. So it's, it's, it's great to hear uh, a testimonies like that. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, what difference does one's view on the question of origins make to one's uh, Christian faith? Of fundamental importance as Christians, uh, what, what one's view is as to whether we are the result of a mind and purposeful intent or or whether we are the result of blind, mindless, purpose, purposeless uh, forces of nature. Uh, are we the result of, um, of a, are we here as a result of purpose or are we here as a result of chance and necessity? So I think that's tremendously important. And I think it has tremendous bearing on, on the view that one comes to with respect to God's providence in nature. And moreover, uh, there, there are certain theological issues which flow from one's view of origins, in particular, the origins of humanity. Uh, was there an historical Adam or was there not an historical Adam? That's a fundamental question, I think, that we need to, uh, uh, to investigate as Christians, because uh, the, the Bible makes very clear in the New Testament that, uh, that as a result of one man's sin, death came to all men because all men sinned. And so... Uh, the, 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 whole, the whole concept of the gospel is predicated upon uh, one's view of human origins, the fact that there really was a literal fall, and, and uh, as such, we all um, live under, uh, we, we live in a fallen world that is under God's judgment, and it's only through the cross of Christ that we can actually be uh, made right again with God and, and reconciled to a holy God and justified in sight and declared righteous before him, and uh, so, so I, I think one's view of origins is, is immensely important. The scripture makes it clear that mankind is not just uh, quantitatively different from other animals, but qualitatively different. Man alone is said to possess the imago dei, or the, the image of God. And uh, we are, uh, I think, unique among the animal kingdom in that we possess that imago dei, and we uh, alone are or spiritual beings which have the capacity to have a relationship with our Creator. Okay. Uh, Dr. Miller, with your studies in uh, physics, how do you see uh, that being compatible with a Creator of the universe, and how does that um, point to a Creator rather than some evolutionary process of, of how all of this came about? Uh, yeah, there are several lines of evidence. So I personally went through a faith crisis in co college also, and what helped bring me back to faith was my study of science. And in particular, what modern science has shown is that the universe had to have a beginning. And because the universe had a beginning, all time and space itself began, means there had to be a designer or a creator outside of time and space that created everything in a burst of energy exactly as the Bible describes. Also, when you look at the laws of physics, what you find is it's incredibly unlikely for any set of laws to produce a universe that can sustain life. To have a universe that sustains life, to have planets, to have chemistry, you have to have several equations which govern our universe that are very carefully designed to make that to happen. Also, you have to have the strength of the different forces of nature, like uh, the force of gravity, the electromagnetism, the strong and nucle weak nuclear force have to be the exact strength because if they're slightly greater or slightly less, you wouldn't have planets, therefore you wouldn't have life. Also, when you look at the, issue, the origin of life, what you find is even though we have a universe that sustains life, a planet that sustains life, you're never going to get a cell unless there's design behind it. Because the way our universe works is there's a tendency for, for nature to take things from high energy to low energy, like water runs downhill, it doesn't run uphill, also from order the disorder, what people call entropy, and when you look at life, the first cell, the simplest possible cell, had very high energy and very high order, which na nature could never produce itself any more than nature would cause water to run uphill. So when you look at the laws of physics designed for life, when you look at the nature of life, it all points to a designer. Okay. Thank you for that. Dr. Rana, um, what do you see is, is some of the strongest evidences for God's existence from biochemistry? Well, something that has always struck me as really provocative is this idea that 
when you look at the nature of biochemical systems, the way that they are structured, the way that they function, they are in many instances identical to the designs of man-made systems. In other words, when human beings design, when we create, when we invent systems, objects, and devices, those things that we produce have certain properties, certain telltale features that reflect the work of a mind, and these very features are the hallmark characteristics of biochemical systems. And so if certain features reflect the work of a human mind and we see those same features, but yet they are far more uh, superior and, and elegant inside the cell than anything that human beings could produce, is this not evidence that they are to the work of a mind? And so uh, when you look at many protein complexes in the cell, they literally are machines that are identical to the types of machines that we would produce as human designers. Uh, one of the things that I think is absolutely mind-boggling is the fact that the cell's machinery that manipulates DNA uh, is literally functioning in the same way that a computer system functions at its most basic level. In fact, the similarity is so great, it has spawned an area of nanotechnology called DNA computing, where scientists are basically building computers from DNA and the cell's machinery that manipulates DNA. And these computers are found in little test tubes that are about this big, and they're more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer system that we have built, again, as human engineers. And so when you see that kind of harmony and, and resonance between the nature of biochemical systems and human designs, to me it's incredibly provocative and I think compels belief that there's a mind behind life itself. Okay, okay. And uh, Dr. McClatchy, the, a question I want to ask you, especially when Dr. Rana there was talking about um, this, a cell being like, like a machine or the, com the components of this small thing that we can't even see with the human eye being so complex. Um, I've, I've heard of a term uh, known as irreducible complexity. Uh, can you tell our audience what irreducible complexity is and how does that present a challenge to Darwinism? Well, irreducible complexity was a concept developed in, uh, uh, by Michael Behe um, in his, his classic book, Darwin's Black Box, which was published in the late 90s. And he basically looked at several macromolecular machines in the cell, which are performing a function. And the, these, uh, these macromolecular machines are contributed by a number of subfunctions. And basically, the, the concept of vertical complexity, um, as I would define it, um, which develops upon Mike Behe's ideas, is to say that um, you have uh, that the removal of one of these subfunctions renders the, the overall system non-functional. And so the question is, how would you how would you evolve one of these macromolecular machines? Um, because you have these discontinuous jumps in complexity, which are not uh, bridged by a stepwise new Darwinian pathway, if you will. Um, the, the way that might be he defined our disciple complexity in uh, Darwin's black box uh, was uh, in terms of structural components. If you, you have a system such as the bacterial flagellum, for example, you remove one structural component, the overall system um, ceases to work. But there's, a, there's at least an irreducible complex core of, of some components that are associated with an irreducible complex system. And you remove one component of this irreducible complex core, and the overall system ceases to function as it does in the cell. One, one uh, shortcoming, I think, of the original formulation of the concept of irreducible complexity is that you can have a, a component which is rendered essential um, by modification or even loss of other components. And so you could produce um, an, an illusion that one particular component was almost essential when originally it was only helpful and it was, it was rendered essential later by the modification or loss of other components. I think that this uh, particular objection can be remedied if one takes the uh, formulation of the concept or complexity that I've just offered, where you have a set of sub-functions which are contributing to the overall function. You remove one sub-function and the overall function ceases to exist. Uh, to take a, an example, and Mike Behe uh, proposed um, as an illustration of vertical complexity, the idea of a, of a mouse trap, and you have various parts of the, the mouse trap. You have the spring, you have the, the, um, the holding bar, you have uh, the, the plate, and, the, uh, and so on. And, um, and so, so the, the idea is that you remove one of these components from the mouse trap, and the mouse trap no longer performs its function, which is to catch mice. 
Um, but imagine that you were to uh, duplicate the spring and say how you have two springs, and so you could evolve a rat trap out of a mouse trap, right? Because rats are bigger than mice, and so you need multi you need uh, two springs to catch bigger mice to catch bigger rats. Um, but imagine that the first spring uh, became modified in some way or even lost, and so now the second spring is rendered essential, even though it was originally only helpful. But the fact that one spring uh, the, the, you can, the, the fact that you can change the identity of the spring doesn't change the fact that you still need something performing the function of the spring. Um, and so that's um, how I would um, define the, the concept of complexity, which I think presents a formidable challenge to the neo-Darwinian stepwise pathway. Charles Darwin, in his book, The Origin of Species, basically said that if it could be shown that one complex organ existed, which could not um, possibly have been brought about by numerous successive slight variations, then the theory would absolutely break down. And so the concept of vertical complexity is basically the assertion that there are such systems in biology. Um, and I would say that it not only presents a challenge to Darwinism, but it also presents a positive case for the concept of design, because an intelligent design is the only known cause that, is, that has the ability, that has the, uh, the ability to force, to, uh, it has, it has the attribute of foresight. And so it has the ability to bring everything together that is necessary to actualize a complex endpoint. Okay. Uh, doc Dr. Rana, uh, how do you link the biochemical case for intelligent design to Christian theology itself? Yeah, this is a really important question because uh, if you make a case for intelligent design, and, and that's part of what I do as I argue for God's existence, uh, the concern would be that by not identifying the designer or anchoring it to the Christian faith, you could very well produce scientific evidence that could be co-opted from people let, who, let's say, would in, embrace Islam as an example. And so the way I like to argue for design is essentially utilizing a watchmaker-type argument. And this is an argument that was uh, developed in the, ninth, sorry, in the 1700s by uh, the British um, theologian, uh, William Paley, who argued that a watch requires a watchmaker and life itself requires a divine watchmaker because he saw similarities between the way in which a watch was structured and the way in which biological systems were structured. And Paley argued you, you could ex easily explain, for example, where a rock comes from through natural processes, but a watch requires a mind. And if biological systems have, again, the properties of a watch, not a, the properties of a rock, then you could infer that it requires a divine mind. And so by comparing human designs to biological designs, uh, you have a real intriguing question. If those designs in biology then reflect the divine mind and they're similar to human designs, how do you explain that similarity? How do you explain what appears to be a resonance between the human mind and the div divine mind? And I think that explanation can be found in the concept of the image of God. That is, human beings are made in God's image, and because we bear God's image, those things that we produce are going to essentially echo what the Creator has already made. And so the, the designs that we've produced as human engineers uh, have already been anticipated uh, in nature, yet we were unaware of many of these designs until, we, until only recently as we begin to develop good understanding of the structure and function of, let's say, biochemical systems. So I think it's approaching the design argument from a watchmaker standpoint that allows you to make that connection to Christian theology uh, via the concept of the image of God. Okay. So from something as, as simple as a, as a mousetrap to uh, all the way to a cell, we, we see that there is definitely design here, that th this could not have come, an, come about by chance. Uh, Dr. Miller, uh, with your education in, in physics, what do you see as, uh, as, as evidence that this could not have just come about? And what com what com uh, irreducible complexity or, do, or what screams design to you uh, in, in the area of physics? Uh, great. And just a, a little of my background, I also studied engineering both when I was at MIT and then later I was on the uh, the board of an inventor's deal. So what happens is when you look at engineering and as who it's applied to it, what you find is any designed system has design constraints. 
So for instance, if you have a car, you have to have wheels which are attached to somewhat access to a steering, uh, steering wheel to make it function. And what happens in design is you're able to improve designs with slight modifications. So for instance, if you have a car, you might make the wheels larger, you might make them smaller, you might tighten up those, and that, that slight changes that optimize the car and make it better. But when you deal with engineering, what happens is if you go from one design with a certain design logic and certain design constraints to a completely separate design with different design constraints and a different design logic. So for instance, if you try to go from a car to a helicopter, what happens is what makes a good car makes a very bad helicopter and vice versa. So as you try to transition from the car to the helicopter, the car gets much, much worse before the helicopter can fly. You see the exact same principle in engineering um, in terms of biology. So for instance, what was mentioned was the flagellum, and the flagellum looks essentially like a rotary motor. It has the same basic design logic, the same design constraints. And the challenge is whenever you look at these design systems, they don't function at all until you essentially have all the pieces perfectly put together for it to function. Now, evolutionists will often argue, maybe you could start with some other design, like for instance, what's called a type three secretion system. And that's essentially a, a, a machine in a bacteria that helps to inject poisons. And they argue that perhaps you could start with a lot of the same pieces in this type three secretion system, and then maybe add a few more pieces and turn it into a flagellum. The challenge is you have the same problem with the type three secretion system and the flagellum as you do with the car and the helicopter. What happens is you have these different machines with completely different design constraints with a different design logic. So if you start to change one design into another design, what happens is you have to make the first system much, much worse before you make the, the next system much, much better. And that's true in all evolutionary scenarios. So if you look at, for instance, the lung of a reptile, which is essentially like a sac, air goes in, air goes out, versus the lung of a bird, which is very different. The lung of a bird is like a tube. Air goes in one way and goes out the opposite way, and air only goes in one direction. If you try to turn one system into the other through slight mutations, slight modifications, what happens is the first animal will die if you sort of puncture holes in the lung of the, of the reptile, it dies long before you make the thousands and thousands of slight modifications into the lung of a bird, which is based on a different design logic and a different design constraint. So again, when you look at the physical constraints on design systems, you can never change from one system with the one design logic into a different system with a different design logic, yet that's exactly what you have to do with macroevolution. So again, microevolution is optimizing slight improvements like the crossbreeding dogs, which is true and is observable, but that can never turn into macroevolution, which is completely changing the design logic of any animal. Okay, okay. Great. Well, uh, callers, uh, we would like callers. Uh, all, all of the, our scholars today would, uh, I'm sure, welcome any questions that you may have. So we have a number of, uh, a number of numbers on the bottom of your screen there. Uh, no, regardless of where you are in the world, uh, please call in. We'd love to have uh, some questions for our guests today. Uh, we have a, 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 a number of different uh, areas that I'd like to uh, touch on, though. Um, Dr. Rana, uh, scientists are on the cusp of being able to create artificial cells in the laboratory. Uh, does this work threaten the Christian faith uh, in, in so that if we get closer and closer to being able to create, obviously we can we never create something from nothing, but as man or as scientists continue to learn more about how things work as they do, um, as, as time goes on and we learn more and more, uh, after, we're gonna come up on a, a break here uh, just in a minute, but after the break, I'd like you to answer the question, uh, does this in any way threaten the Christian faith? Uh, but we are going to take a break uh, right now uh, for just uh, a couple minutes. And uh, please stay tuned. So we're going to we're come back with our, our three scholars who are going to give us a bunch of information on uh, biology and the Bible and how science and faith are compatible. So uh, please stay tuned. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. You can now watch ABN in the Trinity channel on your iPhone and iPad. Search for ABN Sat in the App Store. You can watch all the following channels. The Arabic Channel, the English Trinity Channel, the Worship Channel, the Sarath Channel, the Kurdish Channel, 
the al Qadus channel, the prayer channel, and a special channel for Europe and the Middle East. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the fifth International Apologetics Marathon on ABN Sats and the, the Trinity Channel. Uh, it's such a blessing to have these marathons where people from around the world, in, in uh, Europe, Australia, the Middle East, and even uh, here in America, can, can watch for a week or sometimes two weeks straight uh, multiple shows on apologetics. And apologetics is uh, the, the defense of, uh, Christian apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. And it just amazes a lot of people that uh, have believed for so long that, that religion or Christianity is like a blind faith, that it's, it's uh, basically intellectual suicide because there's no evidence for it whatsoever. So uh, you're, you're stupid or you're, you're, or something like, or you're dumb if you believe in God, if you believe that the Bible is God's word, that you, if you believe in creation. But there is a ton of evidence for uh, Christianity and for a designer versus uh, a Darwinian evolution. And wouldn't it be great if uh, even things like this, apologetics, could be taught on uh, school campuses uh, throughout the world? Uh, there's good news that actually is happening. I work for a ministry called Ratio Christi at uh, R-A-T-I-O-C-H-R-S-T-I dot org. And uh, Ratio Christi is Latin for the reason of Christ. And what we do as we equip university students and faculty to give historical, scientific, and philosophical reasons for following Jesus Christ. The show that we're doing right now is called Biology and the Bible, Evidences for the Life Sciences, and uh, how that basically gives reliability to the scriptures. And we have three great guests with us today. We have Dr. Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe. We have Dr. Jonathan McClatchy from the UK. We also have Dr. Brian Miller. And again, please call in because our, our guests would love to answer any questions that you may have. But right before the break, I asked Dr. Rana uh, to answer the question, how does uh, the work that scientists are doing as they're learning more and they're, they're quote unquote uh, being able to describe how something can come from nothing or they're basically trying to give evidence for Darwinian evolution. So as scientists learn more and more each year, uh, Dr. Rana, how do, does that in any way threaten the Christian faith? Well, you know, one of the things that um, I think is interesting is that the more that we uncover about the way the cell works, uh, the more evidence that we have uh, that the cell is the product of a mind and the, the more uh, significant the problems are for any kind of evolutionary explanation for the origin of life itself. Now, one of the things that's rather interesting is that there's a whole new area in the, in the life sciences called synthetic biology, where the goal is to try to create artificial life, to create non-natural synthetic life forms. And one uh, area of this work involves trying to create something called protocells, which are chemical super systems that assume the properties of cells. And uh, life scientists are making some significant strides towards creating artificial cells in the lab. But, and, and many times people that are involved in this work will argue, if we can make life in the lab, that, that provides evidence that life could have evolved on Earth. Uh, they, they argue that this means that there's nothing really special about life itself and that this will give us clues as to how life originated. But my perspective on this is actually very different. I would actually argue that the attempts to create artificial cells in the laboratory provide extremely powerful evidence uh, that intelligent agency is critical to transform molecules into a living entity. And the reason why I would say that is because when you look at the work and what's required to transform inanimate matter into living matter, it involves essentially intelligent agents who are incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly insightful, developing elaborate strategies that then are executed under highly controlled conditions by highly skilled scientists in a laboratory setting. And this, in effect, is showing intelligent agency is the central ingredient, the central uh, component in transforming inanimate matter to 
uh, again, living systems. And one of the things that you would never have available to you on the early Earth, if, at, least, at least if you're looking at the origin of life from an evolutionary standpoint, would be intelligent agents. Uh, but if you take a, a creation perspective, you would argue that it was the mind of God, it was God himself that was intervening to bring about the very first life forms. And I think synthetic biology is providing us with an empirical set of evidence that, again, a creator was responsible for life's origin. Okay. So it, it takes an intelligent mind to discover design in, in things, and even in the smallest things, such as a cell. Exactly right. Okay. So, uh, Dr. McClatchy, um, now, now that we're kind of uh, moving towards more of Darwinian evolution, and we're, uh, we talked about the complexity and how things have moving parts, and, and parts are dependent upon other parts, and so on. Uh, what is the theory of intelligent design, and what is the evidence that life is the result of purposeful intent as opposed to just blind processes of nature or that things just evolved over time with no intelligent mind whatsoever to bring that about? Well, intelligent design can be defined as the study of patterns in nature which bear the hallmarks of intelligent causality. Uh, so intelligent design um, is, is the, the intelligent design provides us with a tool set, if you will, an apparatus for inferring what is the product of design versus what is the product of natural stochastic processes such as um, natural selection, range of gen genetic mutation, um, or other chance and necessity non-intelligent processes. Uh, so my first degree was in forensic science. And forensic science can be called the discipline of design detection. We want to know whether someone uh, was died of natural causes or whether they were murdered or was a fire the result of arson or was it um, a, a natural fire or an accidental fire, right? So intelligent design um, already is present in science. We, we already employ methodologies for inferring and detecting design. In fact, the, the SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uses design principles to determine whether there might be extraterrestrial intelligence elsewhere in our universe. And so intelligent design is predicated upon the historical inductive method of scientific reasoning. Uh, it's historical sciences um, are um, based on what's called the abductive method. The abductive method um, can also be called the method of inferring to the best explanation for multiple competing hypotheses. And basically it was a methodology employed um, even by Charles Darwin in the formulation of his theory of evolution by natural selection uh, as he was inspired um, having read uh, the work of the famed 19th century geologist Charles Lyell in his uh, Principles of Geology where basically he, uh, Charles Lyell argued that if you want to explain changes in the Earth's surface, you want to be looking for causes currently in operation, which are known to produce the effect in question. So intelligent design basically looks at uh, what we find in the cell, namely information and uh, irreducible complexity and systems which seem to require foresight and planning and agency and uh, and the ability to visualize complexity and um, bring things together to actualize complex endpoints. And says so in every realm of experience, these types of phenomena are attributed to intelligent causes, not natural or material processes, um, not processes involving merely chance and necessity, but involving intelligent agency, conscious, rational, deliberative agency. And so intelligent design is a challenge to the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which basically maintains that we are the result of blind processes and argues, you know, there, there is certainly evidence of design, irrespective of whether the proposition of common ancestry is true, because you can have, you know, there, yet one has to distinguish between pattern and process. So one might argue that there is a pattern of descent with modification, that's arguable, um, that's a different discussion. And then there is a process which one invokes to explain or account for that pattern, which in the case of Neo-Darwinian biology is natural selection, genetic mutation, genetic drift, and other evolutionary mechanisms. Whereas intelligent design, by contrast, would argue that agency is fundamental ingredient in the explanation for life's origins and development on Earth. Okay. 
And uh, based on something that you had just said, you'd mentioned uh, mutation. Um, when, can you explain uh, real quick what a mutation is? And when there is a mutation, is that a good thing or a negative thing? I mean, when, when there's a mutation, does that does it actually add good information or is that more of a, a uh, negative effect uh, in any way? Right. Uh, genetic mutations were unknown to Darwin. Darwin didn't know that uh, that didn't know what mutations were. He only um, said that, like, that evolution happened by means of natural selection acting on chance variations. Um, it was it wasn't um, until later that we we really understood uh, the genetics of life and, and what actually is going on at the molecular level. And um, we we now understand that life is. Um, it is that the evolution happens by mutations in DNA, and these results in different gene variants are called alleles, and the successful gene variants are preserved by natural selection, and the ones which which um, preserve which um, facilitate a successful phenotype, that is the the, um, outward, the, the, the organism itself, what, what makes it fit to survive and go on to produce its uh, going to produce um, um, progeny, uh, th those successful gene variants are preserved by natural selection. So as to your um, question, what is, um, are, are mutations helpful or are they harmful? Well, both, it, and some mutations are, I'd say probably most, the vast majority of mutations are harmful to the organism. Some are in fact beneficial. For example, some mutations can confer antibiotic or insecticide resistance. Um, but they don't tend to um, be advantageous in the sense of adding new information content. They tend to be advantageous in the sense that, I mean, to give an illustration, if you are fleeing from an enemy army and you run over a bridge and as you blow up the bridge in order to, to prevent the enemy army from um, chasing after you, then that's advantageous to blow up the bridge, but it's still, um, it's still destructive in nature. So that's, that's uh, the, the, the nature of mutations. And of course, it takes an intelligent mind to blow up a bridge uh, as well. So uh, we do have a caller. Uh, his name is Albert. Uh, welcome to the show, Albert. And who is your question for? Uh, yes. Um, my, hi. Uh, first, I just want to thank you guys for this show. Um, I'm, I like it. I really uh, like it. I think um, Praise God. I'm learning a lot about biology and the Bible. And, uh, but I do have a couple questions if that, that's okay. Yes, is there, uh, would you like to ask uh, one of our uh, in guests in particular the question, or is it for any uh, of them? Yes, uh, uh, Rana, is it his name? Do Dr. Fuzz Rana, yes. Okay, so uh, my, my question, uh, now I want to make it clear, I, I do believe in God, but uh, my question is like, were there, was there really a garden of Eden, like was Adam and Eve there? So that's that's my first question. And my second question would be, um, how can how can uh, how can we we know that Noah was really there? Was it like a true man? Was the flood was really there? And would that mean as humans we are the descendants of Noah? So those are my well, Albert, questions. Albert, those are uh, great questions, and uh, I've actually uh, written a book called Who Was Adam where I address those questions. And so if you want to dig deeper into those, those topics, I would recommend you take a look at my book, Who is Adam? Uh, but I believe that there really was a historical Adam and Eve, not only because I think that's what scripture teaches, as uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier, but I also think that there is scientific evidence that is uh, consistent with the idea that there was a historical Adam and Eve. Uh, for example, by uh, evaluating genetic variability of people around the world, uh, you can actually get insight and information about the early stages of human history. And it turns out that using mitochondrial DNA as a genetic marker, uh, you can trace the origin of every person back to a single ancestral sequence uh, that is referred to as mitochondrial Eve in the scientific literature. And there are some scientists who think that uh, this ancestral sequence corresponds to a single female individual. Likewise, when you look at uh, Y chromosomal DNA data, you can trace the origin of every man on the planet back to a single ancestral sequence of Y chromosomal DNA data, or the, sorry, Y chromosomal DNA, 
and that some people, again, think that this corresponds to a single male individual. And so it's rather provocative to think that with these two genetic markers, we, we have what appears to be possibly a single male and a single female individual that all people on the planet can trace their origin back to. And it's provocative that in the scientific literature, they're dubbed mitochondrial even Y chromosome atom. And so it's like we have a problem with the feed with uh, Dr. Fuzz Rana, so we will get back to him and, uh, and uh, finish uh, answering your questions there, Albert. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy or Dr. Miller, we do have another question from a YouTube viewer. Or we do not. We're going to take a break instead. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. Uh, please stay with us. Stay tuned because we're going to come back and, and ask more questions to our scholars in reference to biology and the Bible and how evidences from the life sciences help to uh, prove Scripture's reliability. So please stay tuned. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. To our viewers all over the world, you can watch us by satellite through the following frequencies. For North America and Canada, please join us on the Galaxy 19 satellite, frequency 11966 horizontal. For Europe and Middle East, join us on the Hot Bird satellite, frequency 12111 vertical. For Australia and New Zealand, please join us on the Optus 2 satellite, frequency 12546 vertical. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Welcome back everyone to the Trinity Channel and our fifth International Apologetics Marathon. Uh, if you are just tuning in for the first time today, we want to welcome you. Uh, this is a week-long apologetics marathon. It began yesterday, and if you go to the uh, YouTube and you go to the Trinity Channel's uh, YouTube uh, page, you'll see a number of videos from yesterday. And we have about another 13 shows coming up. Uh, through uh, to, uh, this afternoon, this evening, and also tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. Also, we have two debates happening tomorrow, and we have a debate on Thursday as well. We're going to have debate follow-up, of course, and there'll be an opportunity for you to call in uh, during those uh, debates, especially during the debate follow-up. And also, too, we welcome your calls during this entire marathon. Again, we have multiple shows on different topics from uh, right now. We're doing one on uh, biology in the Bible, so it's referring more to scientific apologetics. But, of course, we have a number of shows on Islam. We have, uh, again, all the debates coming up, and we have a, a very unique show yesterday on Muhammad and Joseph Smith striking similarities between the prophets of Islam and Mormonism. And that was with uh, a lady named Dr. Lynn Wilder, who is a former Mormon for over 30 years and former tenured BYU professor. She's coming back on Friday to do a show on Mormonism by itself. So if, you're, uh, if you know Mormons, if you are a Mormon yourself uh, and you'd like to hear from a, a, a person who has uh, that type of a level of education in Mormonism and has, has studied it in depth, uh, please, please tune in Friday. And again, all the other shows as well that are coming up, please stay tuned. All these shows are available on YouTube to watch, to share with your friends, to post on Facebook, to post on Twitter, etc. Again, my name is Tony Grulay. I work with Ratio Christi. We are a, a campus apologetics alliance. What that means is that we set up Christian apologetics clubs on school campuses throughout the world. We've only been around about six years, but we currently have about 160 clubs on university, college, and community college campuses around the United States. We have international clubs as well. And now we've moved down into high schools uh, as well. So just about any, uh, anyone who's on any campus from high school up through university, go to ratiochristi.org. That's spelled R-A-T-I-O-C-H-R-I-S-T-I.org. And you can find a map of, of the world, and you'll see little pegs of where all of our chapters are. And if you're a student on campus, this is a, uh, a co-curricular club that you can come to that takes place on your campus where you can d talk about this kind of stuff every single week. Uh, sometimes you'll be watching a debate in, in a classroom. Sometimes you'll be going through an apologetics book together. 
But uh, we have uh, commendations uh, from, from so many people. Uh, we've had endorsements from Josh McDowell, Sean McDowell, uh, Matt Slick from CARM, Ravi Zacharias, David Noble from Summit Ministries. Uh, Mike S. Adams recently said that Ratio Christi is the greatest thing to happen to campus ministries in, in decades. So we have uh, many well-known uh, apologists who uh, recommend us, and we've grown so much in the last six years. So uh, go to ratiochristi.org, and you'll be able to find out more about that. But again, that gives you an opportunity on your school campus to talk about apologetics, to learn about apologetics, to get better equipped in apologetics. And we give people the scientific, philosophical, and historical reasons for following Jesus Christ. Now, we, we love that you're, you're tuning into this marathon, and we, we do welcome your calls for our callers. We had a couple. But we're having a little bit of an internet issue right now, so we're trying to get uh, th them back on the show. But we are, are blessed to have Dr. Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe, and you can go to reasons.org and check out his website. We have Dr. Jonathan McClatchy from the UK, and we have Dr. Brian Miller, who's an apologist for every nation, churches, and campus ministries. Now, uh, before the, the, the break, we had a question about, uh, did Adam and Eve actually exist? And Dr. Fuzrana was in the process of uh, answering that question, and as soon as we get him back, he will finish doing that. Um, something that I usually talk with people about as far as, uh, as, far as Adam and Eve, and just, uh, you know, I, I start like this. I say, hey, you know, you and I are here right now, and, and we exist because we had parents, right? And they had parents, and they had parents, and they had parents, and it goes right back to Adam and Eve. Now, I tell people, I said, now, just for the sake of argument, let's say that there were people before Adam and Eve. We still have to ask the question, well, where did they come from? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? You, you, can't, ha you can't do that forever because you cannot have an infinite amount of finite beings. You can't have an infinite amount of finite causes. You cannot traverse an infinite amount of anything in, in a finite world. You can, you can keep adding another, but that cannot go on forever. At some point, you have to have a, a first cause, an uncaused cause, or an uncreated creator. Now, that doesn't automatically prove the, the God of Christianity, the God of the Bible. But if you read the Bible, you, if you study uh, systematic theology, you study philosophy and, and metaphysics, um, it, if, you, if you look at the attributes of a being, I mean, uh, you and I, you know, we exist, we had a beginning. We can, we can, we can, uh, write down the day that we were born. And of course, we existed for about nine months before that, but we had a beginning. We did not always exist. We have potential. We get old. We can learn. We can do these scientific experiments that we're talking about today. Um, we ha we can, can learn. We, don't, we aren't all knowing. And if we go back and back and back, and let's just go to Adam and Eve, like the Bible says. They didn't always exist, and if anyone existed before them, they didn't always exist. That's what I'm saying. You, you had to have had a, a, a beginner, someone who caused that which began to exist. And it's real simple just to go to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that word beginning is referring to that which began to exist, right? The space-time material, material universe now, if the space-time material universe began to exist and God was there at the beginning, he had to have been there before the beginning, right? Uh, and, and since the space-time material universe began to exist, God cannot be any of those things because if he was, he would have had to create himself, which is, is logically impossible because God would have had to exist before he existed in order to cause himself to exist, which... Uh, can't happen. So, uh, but but if we just look at this design, which just points to a, a creator, and when Dr. Jonathan McClatchy and, and Dr. Fuzzron and Dr. Brian Miller were talking about uh, the complexity of cells and the irreducible complexity, and just uh, all all this amaze all this amazing stuff that scientists have found over the years, 
It just screams for a designer. I mean, how can that come about on its own? And one thing I want to ask our, our uh, scholars about uh, when we do get them back is um, give, give our audience, give you and even give me um, some, some statistics to try to give us an idea of what are the chances of even something as, as, as uh, simple, if we want to call it that, as a cell coming about from nothing, or how they, they talk about the, 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 what, what the, basically the, the design of the cell and the mechanisms within that cell, how can that happen without a cause? And, and how can that come from, from nothing? Uh, it's, 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 it's impossible, and it's, um, it's, it's much easier, I mean, isn't it much more reasonable to believe that someone created everything then nothing blew up and became an organized everything, right? I mean, it's great to have scholars on who are able to, to answer these um, specific questions about cells and, and uh, physics and microbiology. Um, but even just your average person on the street, I mean, you know, this, this table, uh, the, uh, this, this building, I mean, you can't have a building without a builder. You can't have a painting without a painter. You can't have creation without a creator, right? And, and all, all of this stuff, it, it has design to it. And nothing just happened. And I, I don't, and there's nothing in this world that we can point to and, and say, oh, that just happened. Because if we say, okay, well, do me a favor and try to recreate that. Uh, if we asked a scientist to create sand, something as simple as sand or dirt, uh, they, they can't, right? And we say, well, no, no, you can't, you can't use any tools. You can't use any kind of material. Just, just create it. Just create dirt. Just create sand. I mean, that's not complex like this table here or, or like this building. But just, just create it. I mean, choose whatever you want. Create it from nothing. And even if they were able to, it's still an intelligent mind who is creating from nothing, right? But again, they can't create from nothing anyway. So I, I don't see any evidence whatsoever for Darwinian evolution or that something can come from nothing. And if nothing can come uh, about on its own, if, if there was ever a time when, when nothing existed, think about that, if, if nothing existed, no one existed, no matter how far back you want to go, if you want to say, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, or even millions or billions of years, however far back you want to go, if there was ever a time when nothing existed, nothing would exist now because nothing comes from nothing. But if anything at all exists, whether that's a person or a cell or a star or whatever you want to point to, if anything at all exists, something or someone always existed. And that, that's uh, known as the, uh, the co uh, cosmological argument, uh, the argument from contingency. There's a, there's a number of arguments uh, to argue for a, a beginner, uh, someone who has existed, who caused that which began to exist. And if that which began to exist has potential, it didn't always exist, then something outside of that space-time universe had to have always existed. And like I said earlier, that doesn't automatically prove the God of the Bible. But if you read through the Bible, and again, if you study, again, like I said, uh, theology, uh, systematic theology, philosophy, the attributes of a being who could cause something from nothing, the attributes of a being who is all-knowing, who is eternal, who ha you know, has no beginning, who's not in time, which is the measurement of, uh, of motion or movement. All of these attributes line up with the God of the Bible. Because nowhere in this Bible does it say, uh, God is, and then it has all these like uh, philosophical attributes that we use. But philosophy is is commonly known as is the handmaiden to theology, because 
good philosophy usually leads to good theology, and bad philosophy many times leads to bad theology. So studying philosophy is another thing that I would encourage you to do. And uh, there are a number of uh, schools uh, throughout the world where you can do distance education. Uh, one of them is Southern Evangelical Seminary, and that's in uh, North Carolina, ses.edu. You will find a number of degrees in, uh, uh, scientific uh, in certificates as well, in scientific apologetics, Islamic studies, uh, theology, uh, religion, philosophy, uh, great stuff. So I would encourage you to check that out. But um, let's get back to the topic of this show, which is, again, biology and the Bible, evidence from the life sciences for Scripture's reliability. And uh, before we had uh, the break, we were, uh, Dr. Fuzz Rana was asked a question by a, a caller about did Adam and Eve exist, and he was in the process of answering that. Uh, Dr. Rana, could you uh, continue where you had left off as far as Adam and Eve? I know you, you mentioned your book, uh, that you wrote on the topic, but, um, and, and I made uh, quite a few comments in the last few minutes about just, you know, if there were people before them, where do they come from? It's, it's, it's the same problem, so might as well just start with Adam and Eve, like the Bible says. But uh, how do you uh, usually answer the question of someone who asks, you know, did Adam and Eve exist? How, how can we know, other than what the, uh, this, this Bible says, uh, what do you know uh, uh, about that as far as that uh, let's just start with them, like the Bible says. Why, why bring anyone in before them or, or uh, anything else? Or Dr. Jonathan McClatchy? And Dr. Brian Miller, uh, we lost again too, so we apologize for that. Um, but yeah, if, if you would like to uh, call in, maybe we, could, maybe we can still take uh, calls perhaps. Uh, there are numbers on the bottom of your screen, depending on uh, where you're located, so there should not be uh, any long-distance uh, charges for you. Uh, we do apologize for the Internet uh, problem that we're having. But uh, let me get back to what I was saying earlier about uh, philosophy. And uh, philosophy is just it is an amazing uh, subject to study because, again, when you talk about uh, metaphysics and epistemology and you know, how can we know what we know and, and, and that kind of stuff, uh, that, I've, I've really seen that studying philosophy has really uh, grown uh, me in, in my faith. Again, faith isn't uh, something that's blind. or I mean, sometimes it is. If you have blind faith, that's not a good thing, though. At Ratio Christi, we say that blind faith is lame. We, we say that because there is so much evidence for Christianity. And if you, whatever you believe, if, if you believe it, and someone were ask, to ask you, why do you believe that? And you say, well, I don't know, just, just what I believe. Well, is that a, a smart thing to do, to believe something when you have no evidence for it? Is it wise to put all of your hope in trust in a particular belief system when that b belief system had a... a a designer, uh, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Islam. Uh, we, we point to, the, uh, to, to Charles Taze Russell, to Joseph Smith, to Muhammad as the, the founders of these man-made religions. And they had a beginning. You know, they, those didn't always exist. And we see that these men, they, they died, and yes, what they taught is, is still around today, but that is no different than, than right now, uh, me asking 10 people to call in from around the world, and let's say, okay, let's, let's start a, a new religion today. On uh, November 10th, 2015, uh, wh what do we believe God is like? Uh, what do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about the, the universe? What do we believe about Scripture? Uh, is the Bible actually God's Word, or should we uh, come up with a new book uh, today? Let's come up with a name for it. Now, if we don't have any evidence for that, it'd be kind of foolish on our part to put any trust, or especially our uh, trust our eternal salvation, in any of those things that we just created today. But let's just say that we created it, we got some followers, and all of a sudden, you know, in the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long, we die. And then that idea, that religion that we just started today, takes off. 
and all of a sudden has hundreds of thousands or even millions or billions of followers, does that change the fact that 11 people on November 10th, 2015, came up with that entire belief system. No, it doesn't. And it's the same thing with all these different man-made religions. So it's good to look to evidence. That's why we are Christians, because we look to the evidence for the Bible, evidence for Christianity, evidence for the existence and resurrection of Jesus Christ, evidence, evidence for a beginner, a unmoved mover, an uncreated creator, etc., who we call God, and we say that that is the God of the Bible. Now, I believe we do have Jonathan and Dr. Uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy and Dr. Brian Miller back. So, I'm not sure if you guys were able to uh, listen to uh, all that I had said the last few minutes, but um, uh, if, if, you had, if you have not, we do want to get back to the topic of biology in the Bible, and I'm so glad to have you guys here because you guys are uh, very uh, knowledgeable on these subjects. Uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, uh, what evidence is there in support of the contention that humans share a common ancestor with, the, with chimpanzees or, or, or other primates that is commonly um, uh, believed by Darwinian evolutionists and are basically uh, taught, that have been taught uh, in many schools today that focus on Darwinian evolution. Uh, they are indoctrinating people to that belief system so what evidence is there to back that up? Sure, there's, there's various kinds of evidence that evolutionary biologists would appeal to to establish human chimp shared ancestry and indeed shared ancestry among uh, humans and other primates as well. Uh, one argument would be the, um, the, fusion, of, uh, the fusion origin of chromosome 2. Uh, in um, other primates, such as chimpanzees, there are 48 chromosomes, whereas in humans, there are um, only 46 or 23 pairs of chromosomes. And uh, scientists um, have, noticed, have noticed that, there, uh, that chromosome 2 appears to be, um, have resulted from a fusion event of uh, two chromosomes because um, the, the um, interstitial there, there are there are sequences that are called interstitial telomeric sequences, which is basically where you have the ends of chromosomes that appear in the middle. The sequences normally associated with the ends of chromosomes are found in the middle. Um, these repetitive sequences that go T T A G G T over and over again, and that is um, uh, um, thought to be evidence of a fusion event. There's also evidence associated with chromosome two of secondary alpha satellite DNA, which suggests a, a second um, centromere, which again um, is, is taken to be evidence of a fusion origin of chromosome two, which is what you would predict under the hypothesis of human chimp shared ancestry. Um, but I, I think that, that that particular evidence makes sense in view of, uh, of a hypothesis of common design as well, and here's why. Uh, imagine that our genus Homo originally did have 24 pairs of chromosomes or 48 chromosomes and uh, underwent a fusion event within its own independent lineage, uh, leading to the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we have today. Uh, so that, that would be perfectly consistent. And then you're just back to the, the, um, the argument from uh, shared similarity, which can be explained just as easily by intelligent design as it can be by common ancestry. Uh, another argument for human chimp shared ancestry might be the um, distribution of endogenous retroviral inserts in primate genomes. It's known that um, over um, the 55 million year history of primates, uh, the genomes of, of these uh, various uh, lineages have undergone invasions by retroviruses. And if these, retroviral, uh, if these retroviruses invade the germline, then they can go on to be inherited by future descendants uh, because they basically use that retroviruses integrate themselves. They are equipped with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which reverse transcribes their RNA into DNA. And basically using an enzyme called integrase, they integrate themselves into the host's genome. And if these go on to be um, inherited by future descendants, then scientists can look at the, the, the distribution of those among primates and see this, this family tree-like structure or this necessary hierarchical distribution of these retroviral inserts. 
And that's thought to be um, powerful evidence for the proposition of common ancestry. And if you, there, there are different genes associated with these retroviral like sequences. There's the envelope gene, the gag gene, the pole gene, and these themselves have incorporated mutations. Um, and the, uh, you can look at the nested hierarchical distribution of those mutations and see how it correlates with the, 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 the family tree produced from the retroviral inserts themselves. And then you can look at the, the long terminal repeat sequences, which are on the, the, the different ends of the retroviral sequence. And you can, can use the degree of, of dissimilarity between these, between these long terminal repeats as a predictor of time sense integration because they have to be identical to the point of integration. So, this threefold argument is thought to be a, a compelling argument for the truth of the proposition of common ancestry. And I think it's one of the more powerful or persuasive argument for uh, common ancestry. Uh, there's also some, some uh, significant problems with, uh, with uh, common ancestry. In any case, I think that even if uh, common ancestry is valid, it's, it, doesn't, uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't provide you with, any evidence, with, with evidence for the causal efficacy of neo-Darwinian mechanisms. And I would argue that um, evolution is not primarily a theory of similarity, but of transformation. How do you go from a chimp-like ancestor to a human being? What types of changes are required to produce that radical innovation in a form? And um, I would suggest that uh, it's, it's beyond what can be accomplished within the, the time frame allowed. The human chimp divergence is reportedly around 6 million years ago. And uh, there's, there's evidence to suggest you require far more than that in order for the relevant changes to take place. OK. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have Dr. Fuzz Rana back. So before I, I wanted to get back to Dr. Brian Miller, I do want to uh, give Dr. Fuzz Rana uh, the opportunity to finish his answer to our caller about why he believes that uh, Adam and Eve uh, did exist. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure where things kind of uh, uh, became uh, just interrupted, but uh, basically, uh, I believe there was a historical Adam and Eve, number one, because I think that's what scripture plainly teaches, but two, I think there is scientific data that does point to the reality of an Adam and Eve. And as I mentioned, this comes from work in what's known as molecular anthropology, where scientists are looking at genetic variability of people around the world to try to gain insight into the origin of humanity. And using a particular genetic marker called mitochondrial DNA, you can show that every person on the planet traces an origin back to a single ancestral sequence that's dubbed mitochondrial Eve in the scientific literature. And with respect to why chromosomal DNA is a genetic marker, every person on the planet can trace an origin back to a single ancestral sequence of Y chromosomal DNA as well. Uh, many people in the scientific community would argue that these ancestral sequences, dubbed again mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, correspond to single uh, female and male individuals. Uh, and I would argue that this is a pointer to the fact that there was really a biblical Adam and a biblical Eve. Now, to be clear, evolutionary biologists would not argue that there is evidence for uh, the biblical account of human origins. This data is interpreted from within the confines of an evolutionary framework. But if you step back and you look at the data and separate the data from the framework, and look at the data from a creation model vantage point, I think this is incredibly provocative evidence that suggests that there is credibility to the biblical account of human origins. Uh, when uh, the Bible says Adam named his wife Eve, she would become the mother of every living person with regard to mitochondrial DNA. This is a, a, a scientifically true statement. And so I think uh, this is incredible uh, that, that, again, there are these scientific pointers to the reality of the biblical account of human origins. Okay. Uh, Dr. Brian Miller, uh, on, on that point of, of going back to an Adam and Eve, um, which of course the Bible uh, uh, plainly uh, tells us, it, it's common for uh, s some people, uh, ev uh, Darwinian evolutionists, to say, well, look at the, the many similarities between human beings and uh, animals or whatever else, and they say, oh, look, see, that means that we came from that, we evolved. Um, th that's the, a common uh, belief held by Darwinian evolutionists, of course, but uh, how would you uh, kind of flip that and say, well, no, 
it, it doesn't point to Darwinian evolution of that we evolved from uh, primates or from uh, other species or uh, genuses, um, but rather it's just a common creator of all of us and all of these other things, uh, but we are definitely different and one kind does not become another kind. It means that each kind reproduces after its own kind. Uh, and thank you, I'd love to. Uh, what do you find, is when you do science, you can't just look at some pieces of evidence out of the context of the overall pattern. And when you look at the overall pattern of the record, what you see is that there are systematic gaps between life. So uh, Stephen Meyer did a beautiful job of describing this in his book on the Cambrian Explosion. But what you find is that the fossil record shows that anything truly novel, any new body plan, any animal with a new architecture seems to just appear in the fossil record without any ancestors, without a series of ancestors leading back to some common source. Then when you look at any fossil in the fossil record, you might see different, uh, the same animal in different layers, and they always look the same. That's the pattern. What happens is evolutionists misinterpret the similarities. So as was mentioned already, similarities can either be common ancestry, meaning that you've got two animals that evolved from a common ancestor, or a common designer. The pattern of nature looks much more like a common design, because if you believed in common ancestry, you'd expect that if two animals were closely related, they should be more similar in all their features than animals that are distantly related. Yet what we see is that you may have animals that are very distantly related, like, like humans and octopi, yet they have the same eye, the similar structure. So you see similarities across, across nature, which points to a common designer, because those similarities are often animals very, very different from each other. So again, what you find is similarities, because I would argue is also a, also a man named Walter Amin, that God deliberately placed similarities in nature to specifically point back to a common designer. And you see a pattern of nature. There's a hierarchy. You've got phylums and classes and orders. There are systematic gaps between them, and yet there are similarities that connect them, but major differences that separate them from an evolutionary scenario. So I would say that's a much better interpretation. Also, when you look at the details, and that's a challenge, when you look at evolutionary biology, they never talk about details. It's always more of these narratives, these stories. It's sort of a secular mythology. But when you actually look at the details of what it takes to create these enormous changes, like from a, a chimpanzee-like creature, whatever the common ancestor they believe it is, to a human, you find there's enormous differences in the neural networks of the brain. That's the way the neurons interconnect with each other. And what you find in engineering is neural networks, which are used to, for language to identify images, can't evolve from one to another because a neural network is a series of neurons with very specific connections which are weighted and situated to solve a certain problem. Yet you can't evolve from one neural network to another for the same reason, that they're highly isolated and one will completely uh, cease to function before you get to a new one. It's the same thing with the anatomy of a human versus the anatomy of our theoretical ancestor. When you look at humans or any animal, they're highly optimized. Every bone, every ligament, every tendon is perfectly interconnected with each other and also connected to the brain to function properly. So any mutation, any changes that we see in that, that architecture is always harmful. And just as a simple example with numbers, is the human population today is about 10,000 times larger than what it was believed to be with our ancestors. Yet in the last century, we have never seen a mutation which has added even one new, new neural network, one new neural connection, which is beneficial. We've also seen no mutations which have altered our architecture in a beneficial way. So if you extrapolate that, what that means with our ancestors is that you'd have to wait over a million years for even one beneficial mutation. So clearly, that's too few to explain these massive architectural differences between whatever our ancestors believed to be in humans, uh, an ostropithecine or, or something like a chimpanzee. Also, and again, Stephen Meyer talks about this in his book, the information for an organism is not simply in the DNA, but it seems to also be in what's called epigenetic information. And Fuzz and others can talk more about this in detail. But so you have in the cellular structures what seem to be a lot of the information needed to create the structure of an animal, the structure of the brain. And as far as we can tell, that can't be changed through any mutation process. So in other words, to go from whatever our ancestors believe to be to a human requires 
enormous amounts of information in a small amount of time, and we've never seen a mutation that would create the sort of changes that would be necessary for that to happen. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. We, do, we have just a few minutes left in the show, and we do have a caller that I want to get to. If we do have time, something that I had mentioned when uh, we had an internet problem there, is if each of you, and we'll do the, again do this after the, the caller, but if uh, basically each of you can give your opinion on the, uh, when it comes to the, the uh, chances of all of this that we see coming about uh, randomly without intelligent design, um, just try to give our audience some kind of uh, uh, ratio or, or like one in whatever chance, that kind of thing. Just let people know how uh, impossible basically it is for all of this to come from nothing and to have no designer whatsoever. But we do have a caller. I am not sure what uh, that caller's name is, uh, but caller, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, what's your name, please? This is Amy. Amy, thank you so yeah. much for calling into the show today. Uh, which one of our scholars is your question for? Um, this question is actually open for any of the scholars who are willing to answer. Okay, great. What is your question? Yeah. Uh, my question is actually about the Darwin theory. Um, how can you prove that this theory of Darwinism is not true? In other words, can you prove that we are not descendants of chimpanzees or monkeys? Um, can you give me like one good reason, a convincing reason, that, that we as humans are special and different from animals? Okay. Dr. Fuzzrana, why don't we start with you, then we'll go to Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, and then Dr. Brian Miller in, in that order. Sure thing, and I'll go very quickly. Uh, I think that you could make the case that human beings are distinct from all other creatures, not so much with respect to our biology, as uh, uh, Jonathan, as Dr. Miller pointed out, you could look at the similarities between humans and other creatures, whether at an anatomical level or at a genetic level, as reflecting common design or common descent. I favor common design, not common descent. But what does seem to distinguish humans from other creatures is that we uniquely bear God's image, and uh, according to Scripture. And Increasingly, there is a movement among uh, anthropologists and primatologists to recognize that there really is such a, such a thing as human exceptionalism, that humans seem to be distinct in kind, not only in degree from the great apes and even from creatures like Neanderthals that are found in the, in the, the fossil record. And so, to me, I think that is very powerful evidence uh, for what scripture teaches about human beings being special is that we are exceptional and that there's a scientific case that's mounting for human exceptionalism in line with the idea that humans are made in God's image. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, uh, same question for you. Sure, I think I would say that even if uh, human chimp ancestry is correct, it's, it, I, do, I still think that it strains credulity to attribute such a transition to neo-Darwinian mechanisms. There was a paper published uh, a number of years back in 2008 in the Journal of Genetics by Rick Durrett and uh, Dina Schmidt, uh, who are mathematicians. And basically they um, looked at, um, they basically they, they, they put forward a population genetics model. And uh, in, in a human population, because remember until very recently, the average effective population size for, for hominids was only uh, 20,000 breeding individuals per generation. And, and they basically calculated that um, in order to get a two-step rewarding mutation in a transcription factor binding site, it would require well, more, well over 100 million years for that to occur. In the case of the human chimp, uh, uh, um, in, case of the in the case of the time since the human chimp divergence, we're, looking, we're dealing with approximately 6 million years. So there, there's a disconnect there between the amount of time allowed by the fossil record and what population genetics is telling us. Okay, thank you. And Amy, I wanna give you uh, our, our third uh, scholar's uh, uh, answer as well, Dr. Brian Miller, uh, same question for you. Uh, yeah, if you, look at, if you look at the uniqueness of humans, it's not that we just have traits, but there's a, a whole series of traits that integrate together to allow us to have thinking, culture, scientific exchange. So for instance, we have sophisticated neural wiring 
abstract thought. We've got a larynx that allows us to have speech. We've got high precision hearing so that we can distinguish between different intonations. We have special circuits in our brain that go between our vocal cords and our hearing centers so that we can have language, we can mimic speech, and, and primates, other primates do not have those circuits. Birds have something similar, but only us. We're able to stand upright so we can use our hands to use tools. We have an opposable thumb and high precision fingers so that we can use tools more effectively. Uh, so the list goes on and on. So what you see is a set of traits that integrate together to allow us to have advanced communication in society. So that's radically different from any other creature. It's not just one, but multiple traits. In terms of the probabilities, even atheists recognize that the chances of a cell coming together by chance is like 1 in 10 to the power of 40,000. That's a 1 with 40,000 zeros behind it. That's like rolling a 6 on a die 50,000 times in a row. So clearly it's impossible from a probabilistic perspective, yet uh, biologists know that. So they hope that there's natural processes that can help beat the odds, but the problem is the natural processes go in the opposite direction. So you're actually loading a die against getting a six, yet expecting 50,000 sixes in a row. And then if you look at even the most minor changes in, let's say, the neural wiring of the brain, what that requires is that you've got to change essentially these launch codes in genes. And the launch codes are like these um, enhancer and promoter regions, which will tell when a protein is launched. It's kind of like a missile launch code. But in development, what's that, what has to happen is you don't simply need the right proteins, but those proteins have to be produced at the right time and place in development. And what happens is the likelihood of, let's say, some new gene being launched in the right time and place is essentially nil, even given like a million generations. So at every level, the numbers are completely implausible for any naturalistic theory if you deny a creator. So much. And that was the kind of the illustration I was referring to about, about taking a dice and you know rolling the same exact number 50,000 times. Dr. Fuzz Rana and Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, um, I wanted to ask, that's something I, was, I, was, I was wanted to get to, was what uh, kind of illustration like that can you give? I mean, something that I've heard is like, let's say you took a, a silver dollar and you, and, you know, you went and buried it somewhere in Texas. And then you told someone, okay, you have one opportunity to go and find it. Never, no matter where you want to go, you can go there, but you only have one chance to find it. And then that person actually going to that one spot where you happen to bury it and finding it. Um, what, what would you say, Dr. Fuzzrana and Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, on an illustration like that, just to give people the, uh, uh, an illustration of the absurdity of all this coming about uh, through Darwinian evolution or especially from nothing? Yeah. Uh, um... Go, Dr. Fuzzrana, first. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I'm not a, a big fan of trying to uh, critique evolutionary, the evolutionary paradigm on the basis of probabilities uh, for a number of reasons. I think a lot of times when we're doing those probability characterizations, it's largely essentially from a standpoint of ignorance as opposed to from a standpoint of knowledge. Uh, but what I do like to point out to, uh, uh, to criticize kind of an evolutionary explanation, let's say for the origin of life, again goes back to a point I made earlier, and that is every attempt to try to generate either life in the lab or different steps that, again, would be required hypothetically to go from molecules to the very first cell in a, a chemical evolutionary scenario inevitably require intelligent agency in order to carry out those steps. And so I prefer not to so much a bang on evolution as I do, as I prefer to actually point out uh, the positive case we can make for uh, the origin of life coming about through intelligent agency. And I think we have, again, time and time again, these empirical demonstrations that intelligent agency is the critical component in transforming molecules into the, into the very first cells or even transferring or, or transforming molecules from uh, more simple systems to more complex systems in a stepwise manner that would be required for the origin of life. Okay, great. So, so even though you don't, you're not uh, a big fan of probabilities, you would still definitely explain to people that it is, uh, 
it's beyond reason to believe that all this came from nothing or that there is absolutely no design whatsoever and that all of this just happened by chance over however many years you want to you want to put into the equation right i mean just real quickly i mean in science there's this expression theories guide and experiments decide and in a sense any kind of theoretical critique we, we apply to Darwinian evolution can in effect be correct and can be powerful, but there's nothing like actual having empirical evidence on your side. And that's why I like to basically go to work that's done in prebiotic chemistry and synthetic biology, because here's the empirical demonstration, regardless of what somebody says theoretically, here's the empirical demonstration, intelligent agency is required. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that and, and, and explaining that. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Clatchy, I want to give you another opportunity as well uh, for your comments on that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Buzz that we should be looking for experimental uh, demonstrations or merely uh, theoretical um, conjectures. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, it, it has been estimated that the so-called universal probability bound, that is to say the the, the maximum amount of the maximum amount of explanatory power that can be attributed to chance is one in ten to one hundred fiftieth power because there's you know, there's um, there's you can, you, there's ten to the eighty elementary particles in the known universe and there's ten to the sixteen seconds since the Big Bang. You also have to factor in the, the so-called Planck time or the time it takes light to traverse the smallest distance. But multiplying those factors together, you can place a, a sort of upper limit on. Uh, the the um, the effectiveness of the chance hypothesis, and beyond that limit, it, it feels the chance really become uh, very um, unconvincing. Um, and uh, when when we look at the cell, when we look at just the the, the amount of uh, the amount of information necessary just to simply produce protein structures and the the uh, and produce enzymes that perform complex chemistry. It seems that the the probabilities of producing those amino acid sequences are prohibitively small. Um, Doug Axe, um, who works at the Biological Institute in Seattle, which is associated with the Discovery Institute, um, basically published a paper in 2004 in the journal Molecular Biology, looking at an en looking at a particular domain of an enzyme complex called beta lactamase, which is an enzyme involved in conferring antibiotic resistance to certain bacteria. And he basically, using a technique called psychoreactive mutagenesis, elucidated that the ratio of, um, of functional to non-functional um, protein folds within combinatorial space is only uh, in the order of 1 in 10 to the 77th power. And when you factor in that, um, that uh, the, the available probabilistic resources, and you, you also take into consideration the fact that the, these, multiple, these probabilities multiply as soon as you're dealing with macromolecular machines, which require multiple protein subcomponents in order to perform their function. And these protein subcomponents have to interlock in specific ways in order to produce their function, and the, the probabilities just multiply exponentially from there. Um, population genetics also, I think, wreaks havoc for the neo Darwinian. Uh, synthesis uh, and uh, just the, the more that we seem to understand about the complexity of biology, the more um, the more um, havoc it wreaks on the New Darwinian paradigm. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, as our audience can see from our experts today, there is uh, basically no evidence whatsoever for. Uh, Darwinian evolution or that uh, even something like a cell could come about from nothing. There's just so much design um, that, that we can see in, in a cell. There's so much design that we can see in everything around us. So I want to thank our guest today, Dr. Fuzz Rana from uh, Reasons.org, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, and also Dr. Brian Miller. I know you can find all of them uh, on, on Facebook. And uh, please look them up on there, on, on, on Twitter. Uh, check out their websites. And if you have uh, more questions for them, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. So please look them up on, uh, on social media. And again, my name is Tony Grillet. I work with Horatio Christie. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter as well. But we want to thank you for joining us during this show. And we have more shows uh, today, again, tomorrow, uh, Thursday and Friday, and debates as well. So please stay tuned to the Fifth International Apologetics Marathon. And uh, we'll see you at the next show. Hello everyone, thank you um, everyone for watching the Trinity Channel, thank you Brother Tony, thank you Dr. Ben Miller.
um, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy from Europe, England, and also Dr. Faz Rana from Reasons to Believe. This was a great show, and thank you for those who call live on air. This is really um, an exciting marathon, apologetic marathon, and this is the fifth one, fifth apologetic marathon that uh, we run here in the Trinity Channel. And if some of you that you have been watching this show, it was really very sophisticated. I watched just, I understood just part of it. It's something to do with biology and the Bible. But I want like just to share two verses from the very first book of the Bible. In, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, thank you for all those who were joining in this show. And as we notice that uh, there's no any evidence from Darwinism theory. Uh, we heard a lot about evolution, about uh, um, uh, origin of life, about gymnasies, probability, molecules, cells, and all that, those kind of things that they are. We, we believe in them. They are from the physics and chemistry, from the creation of God. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, um, we, um, uh, this is uh, day number two of this apologetic marathon. And we have so many other shows and debates, panel discussions. We have also some Muslims, they will be on these panel discussions. Obviously, the four debates between Islam and Christianity. Um, stay tuned, and uh, we need your help to, you, we need you to pray for this channel to continue, to be able to continue producing these uh, great special, unique programs. The channel by itself is unique. Why? Because this is the only channel that is dedicated to apologetics, to such problems in life, like religions, false religions, cults, and uh, even atheism, agnostic, heresies, and all those kind of things. We praise God for so many uh, great speakers. Most of them are from seminaries, from universities, professors from all over the world, from Australia, from Middle East, from Europe, from here America and Canada. And we thank God for many of you that you are helping and supporting this channel. With me is Nawal. She's going to tell you a little bit about what's our vision, how we are expanding and what are the needs for the expand whether through satellites or other uh, platforms keep us in your prayer yes Noah. Uh, thank you dr basim actually expansion is great uh, for the this year 2015 already we launched uh, to hard burden on europe and uh, and uh, very very soon uh, we are expanding to another 21 state uh, here and we are uh, praying to go to the 50 states all over uh, North America. Uh, well, actually, the cost, the cost, the monthly cost is huge. Thus, just for Hotbird monthly, how much? Uh, uh, $15,000 15, every month for the Hotbird satellite, which is targeting Europe and Middle East. This is apart from North America cost. But now, and Australia. yeah, and Australia, of course, yeah. this is another story. But now we encourage you to call the numbers on screen and with your monthly donation, ten dollars, twenty or fifty, whatever you like. Either you send a check to our mailing address or click on abnsat.com. Two minutes to put your uh, donation through PayPal or call the numbers on screen. We can help you right now. There is another show. Uh, after uh, 30 minutes, maybe less, uh, and within this few minutes, we need to hear from you now and pick up the phone, and we would love to hear from uh, you, and we, um, we are welcome each one of you to be part of this great, great uh, mission. 
Thank you, best. Sister Noir. And you could call us live if you are watching us from Europe or Middle East or Australia or here in North America. Please call us live. The numbers are on the screen, 248-416-1300. But also, I'd like just to mention one thing. Like, if you have iPhone, iPad, cell, uh, Android or Samsung, you could down our um, app the app of ABN, which is Trinity Channel, is one of the channels. We have seven uh, channels here on the app. If you just go to your cell phone and download ABN app, which is ABNSAT, I'll repeat that again, ABNSAT, you will be able to watch the Trinity Channel 24-7 through your iPhone or iPad or uh, mobile, uh, smart TV or smart TV or smartphone. And uh, also, you could watch us through live, even through the Facebook or through YouTube. We have YouTube live, but also we, you could uh, buy a small tool. It's called Roku or uh, Chromecast, and j you just hook that uh, like uh, USB to your television, and you will be able to watch us, uh, all these seven channels, and alive. Can he Please buy it? Keep like, us in your prayer. Sorry. Can he buy this? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can he? Uh, can uh, can the, any viewer buy it from like Walmart or from any, any store, store? Best Buy, Walmart, or through Amazon or through the internet. Okay. Um, it's uh, the these things are everywhere. These kind of uh, little uh, new technology, new toys. But these little new toys, you could watch uh, Trinity Channel or ABN, whether if you are in uh, South America or in Australia, if you are in Middle East, in Saudi Arabia or in Iran. Maybe there the website is blocked, but they cannot block what uh, the, this streaming, okay, web streaming. So I encourage you to uh, download our app, but also uh, visit our websites, abnsat.com, visit the trinitychannel.com. You know, just try, try one time, go to your internet and type trinitychannel.com, just once. And I assure you, you will like it, you will learn a lot, you will benefit, but please, if you could do one other uh, uh, thing is if you can tell another five people about this channel, why it is unique, why it's so important. Why? Because the work that we are doing, it's important. This is the only channel that is dedicated, dedicated to apologetics, to false religions and cults. Thank you very much. You could uh, uh, support us either by check or by credit card or call live or by going to our website. God bless you and thank you for supporting and praying for Trinity Channel.